morning, everyone. It is my uh, joy, my privilege to join you this morning to share about Chinois and the Philippine Catholic Church. So thank you very much uh, for this invitation from the USD Historical Society. So there's a lot to cover. So let me start right away. Let me share screen. Uh, can I share it myself so I can control the timing and the sequence? Uh, can I ask the host to enable participant screen sharing, please? There. Okay, so I suppose everyone can see my shared screen. So I begin with this little picture of a street side shrine in Ongpin in Binondo as a symbol no, of the life of the Chinese Filipinos in relation to the Philippine Catholic Church. This is not uh, a church, this is just, just a roadside shrine of a cross, uh, but it is venerated using Chinese liturgical symbols no, like incense. No, but it's a very Catholic shrine, but using Chinese um, ways of uh, veneration and worship. So we'll, say, we'll see more about this in my presentation today. So what would I like to share with you? Well, I'd like to acknowledge to you that the Philippines is unique in Southeast Asia for our having a very strong Western Christian culture after almost four centuries of Spanish colonization. So as you know, we're... we're uh, closing the celebration of 500 years of Christianity uh, in the country. No? And throughout this time, the church has had a special interest in, in evangelizing the southern Chinese traders that have frequented our islands for more than 10 centuries. No? That's something we should always keep in mind, that the trade, the relationship with China goes much earlier. It starts much earlier than colonial times. And when the missionaries came here, there was nurtured that hope of penetrating China from a base here in our country. So what we'll do today is we'll trace those efforts from Spanish to contemporary times. And then I will present some examples of how the Hokkien Chinese identity of the Chinoy Catholics can be preserved through efforts at enculturation, even as we see younger generations of Chinois fully assimilated in the country. So I'd like to cover these six topics in my presentation. No? Uh, first part on, on history, and probably you are much more, uh, much better trained than I am as, as historians, but we'll trace some of that history. We'll talk about identity, who are the Chinese when we say the Chinese or the Chinois. I'll talk about the National Chinese Philippine Apostolate, a ministry to new immigrants. And then this big part also on enculturation. How do Chinoy Catholics integrate their faith and their culture? Or how can that happen? And finally, the importance of this topic in, in Philippine church history and local Chinese studies. So first, the historical context. So I mentioned earlier that uh, we have 10 centuries of relationship with China behind us. But when the Spanish came, um, 1565, I... I, I Suppose we are all very familiar with the importance of this date because while this year or last year until this year, we are marking the 500th anniversary since the arrival of Christianity in the Philippines, we know that it was simply the arrival. No? It was not until 1565 when a big expedition came to really colonize us uh, that structures were put in place. No? So during that period, uh, the Augustinians were the first to arrive in the country and uh, they took charge of evangelizing the Chinese. No? So we first hear of this term, the parian. The parian meaning the uh, uh, area assigned by the Spanish for the Chinese to live in. So it's important to remember that uh, throughout history, this is a map of Intramuros, the parian moved several times. No? So, so it wasn't a fixed place. So you have here numbered the different parts of Intramuros where the Parayan moved during the Spanish era. So the Augustinians were the first to evangelize the Chinese, but since none of them spoke Chinese, we could say that the Chinese were sacramentalized. You know, at that time, they put a lot of value in baptizing 
the, the pagans, no, the non-Christians. And, and even if there wasn't sufficient uh, catechesis, sometimes the baptisms just took place. No? So we could say they were sacramentalized. And yet, when our first bishop arrived, uh, Bishop Salazar, he really uh, paid attention to the Chinese. He praised their good qualities. And there's this quote from him uh, expressing the hope that if the Chinese could be evangelized, they can be the stepping stone to evangelizing the entire Chinese nation you know, with a springboard from the Philippines. So he nurtured this desire, this hope. So that's the, the, the Dominican, the first Dominican Archbishop. And we'll get uh, say more about the Dominicans in a while, no? But uh, moving a bit chronologically, so you have the Augustinians coming in 1565. The Jesuits, my order, arrived in 1581 and stayed until 1768. Uh, there's another story there, the worldwide suppression of the Society of Jesus. So that was implemented in the Philippines. Uh, the Jesuits came back in 1859, but as far as the ministry to the Chinese is concerned, it did not really get revived until the mid 20th century. And we'll see that in a bit. So when the Jesuits arrived, there were already efforts to learn Hokkien, which is the dialect of the Southern Fujian immigrants who were coming to the Philippines from China. So there was, again, that desire to evangelize this special sector of the population, uh, nurturing, again, that desire, that hope that it can be a stepping stone to China. Now, one of the apostolates, one of the churches founded by the Jesuits would be Santa Cruz, in uh, one end of the far end of Ongpin. Uh, it is no longer under the Jesuits today, but it was also a center for evangelizing the Chinese because of its location. Now, back to the Dominicans. So the Dominicans arrived. Uh, I think I shared the article with you on history, no? so you can go into details uh, a bit more on your own. But uh, the, the Dominicans arrived, uh, uh, the bishop first, and then uh, his confreres, and from the Philippines, they were already sending missions to China by 1590. So, you know, it wasn't just a hope, it wasn't just a desire, they were really doing it. From a base in the Philippines, they were going to Fujian province. And then locally, we can identify at least four local missions uh, undertaken by the Dominicans in Manila. First, there's Bai Bai, what is today uh, San Nicolas, there is the Hospital of San Gabriel. Now, if you go to Chinatown Museum, they say a little bit about this no? in the Lucky Chinatown Mall. So you have there mentioned the Hospital of San Gabriel with a church attached to it. It's no longer existing today. No? It only functioned until 1843. The Dominicans were also working in the Parian no? in 1617 and other years. No? The history of the Parian is very complex no? because as I said, it kept moving. And then you have Binondo, which is an island, which is really bought by the governor to be a place for the baptized Chinese to reside. Right? And the Dominicans have had that mission, the church in Binondo, uh, not continuously, but today it survives as the Binondo Chinese Mission Parish. This is a picture of the current small church right behind the big Basilica of San Lorenzo Ruiz. So these are the inclusive years. No? But the Dominicans can be said to have the longest <clears throat> history in the country of working among the Chinese. And to say more about that, no, uh, I, I, I have these slides that came from uh, Ms. Teresita Angsi when she made a presentation on the China connections in the 500 years of Christianity in our country. So you have in your USD archives and library a lot of materials in Chinese. no. And uh, in particular, this, these materials by Professor Jose talking about the missions to Fujian, to China from the Philippines, no? mentioning also uh, one, a Chinese Christian named Joaquin Kuo Pangyong, no? became an assistant of a Dominican missionary, uh, developed a vocabulary dictionary, no? and uh, really is a lay person who came to the Philippines and helped the Dominicans in this uh, mission to, to China. Now, this is not very well known, but I think very important. And then if you 
going to the first books published in the Philippines, you have Chinese connections there also. The, the Dominican, Father Cobo, praising the skills of the Chinese booksellers and bookbinders in Manila, and he himself using some of these books, and then these catechisms uh, printed in the Philippines, on the first books we see printed in our country. So fast forward, you know, very briefly, that's an outline of the history of the mission to the Chinese. Fast forward, 20th century, what happens? In, the, in 1949, when the Chinese communists took power in China, you know, Catholicism was, was established in China. That, you know, that's another historical last. Maybe the communists will not last and they will be able to return to China. But long story short, that did not happen. So you have these hundreds, literally hundreds of Chinese seminarians, priests, plus the Jesuit missionaries. Uh, and, uh, and later on, even the other orders also had uh, missionaries who came here from China, they decided that they would stay in the Philippines and continue their mission here. Some of them did not work among the Chinese. They went to Bindanao and became missionaries there. But the large, in large part, many of them decided or accepted the invitation of local Chinese to start missions among them. And I give us an example, this picture of Mary the Queen Parish, my home parish in San Juan. It started in Pasay in 1954 and then moved to San Juan. It's important to remember that, you know, this is a national chain of schools and parishes that were established in the 1950s and became responsible for evangelizing the local Chinese community. At that time, we were not, I mean, the Chinese community was not, was not predominantly Catholic or Christian. It is because of this 20th century wave of missionaries that we now have a majority uh, Christian population among the Chinese Filipinos. So briefly, that's a historical outline. S second part, I'd like just to uh, enlighten you, share with you that when we say the Chinese, you know, we have to be clear about who we're talking about. No? Uh, I said that the waves of migration, the trading with China has been going on since the 10th century. So you have Chinese people, Chinese from China. In, if you know Chinese, then we call them Chongkoran, Chongkoklang, no? Chinese. No? But because of this history of migration, the Chinese have been going overseas for centuries. There's also this term overseas Chinese, Hua Chiao. No, Chiao in Chinese means a bridge. So literally, it's like from the, China, the perspective of China, you have people building a bridge elsewhere, other countries, and those people, those Chinese who go overseas, they're called Hua Chiao or overseas Chinese. So the first generation that came from the Philippines, came to the Philippines, and maybe the first generation that is born here, they would still orient themselves towards China, and they would be called overseas Chinese. But when you get to the third generation, like me, I'm third generation Chinese in the Philippines, or the fourth or the fifth, which has also happened to families that uh, came here earlier, then you have another term called Huaren or Huai. These are the ethnic Chinese, or in a, to use a contemporary term, Chinois, Chinese Filipinos, meaning we are ethnically Chinese. That is our origin, our, our roots are Chinese, but we're already Filipinos. That's why you have the term Chinois, Chinese Filipinos. Uh, yes, we value our language, our culture, our history, but we're really Filipinos already. Our first language is not necessarily Chinese, no, but probably a local language or English, right? So this awareness is important because, you know, when you lead, listen to the news or read uh, articles in popular media, sometimes these distinctions are lost, no? And why is it important? Uh, well, because later on you will have this phenomenon, new immigrants in contemporary, very contemporary times in the last 20, 30 years. What do we call them? The Xin Chao, the new immigrants, right? So they are different from those Chinese who have been here for decades or even for centuries, all right? So as a percentage of the population, roughly 1%, no, very small actually. But of course, this is not something black and white because there's so much intermarriage already 
Now, how do you really define who is Chinoy and how do you see that in the census or in the statistics, right? But more or less 1%. And as I mentioned today, the community is predominantly Christian to use the broader term. And then 70% are Catholic, 12.9% are Protestant Christian, right? So this is important to remember and also to remember that this wasn't always the case. This really happened because of the work of that latest wave of missionaries from the 50s. All right. So some uh, awareness about uh, identity. No, it's not homogeneous. It's quite complex. Now let me describe the Philippine Catholic Church and how the Ch Chinois fit in. Well, we have a national Chinese Filipino apostolate. No, it, it started in the 50s also when the last foreign bishop of Xiamen, Bishop Juan Velasco, came to Manila and our local bishops assigned him as the vicar for the Chinese, meaning he's in charge of all these communities that were, were being established across the country. And vicar means he had real authority, right? However, after he died, I think sometime 1985, the structure changed. Then we had, uh, it came to be, to be a coordinator rather than a vicar. So presently, the coordinator for the national Chinese Filipino Apostolate is Bishop Leopoldo Haoshan. He's the Bishop of Banged Abra, but he has training in Chinese language. He spent some time in Taiwan. So you see him here with a Chinese uh, design in his chasuble to I, Changchun, God's love is forever. The love of God endures forever. No? So uh, he is the one assigned, but he is a coordinator. No, he has to work with the other local bishops for anything. He doesn't have authority to make decisions for the communities and schools. Because how many are there? There are 17 Chinese Filipino Catholic schools. There are 29 parishes or communities. But all of us, we belong to our respective local dioceses. Bishop Haoshan is more for advancing certain special concerns of the Chinese apostolate. But he has to coordinate very much with the local bishops. Who else belongs to the apostolate? We have ladies associations, 39 of them, you know, even, even bigger, even more expansive than the par parishes. And they are organized as a national federation, very, very well organized. We also have youth groups called Filipino Chinese Catholic Youth, 23 chapters, young adults, 19 chapters, and they are also federated nationally. They have national officers. And then interestingly, we have the Lorenzo Mission Institute founded by Jaime Cardinal Sin in 1987. And they are located inside the San Carlos complex uh, along EDSA in Makati. The vision of Cardinal Sin was to establish this seminary. You know, they study at San Carlos, but they have their own seminary, their own residence. They are training uh, priests for the China mission to become missionaries in China or to serve the Chinese schools and parishes locally, right? So it started in 1987 with both Filipino seminarians and seminarians from China. 10 years later, the first graduates, the first priests from LMI organized themselves into a society of apostolic life. That's a technical term. And they call themselves the Lorenzo Ruiz Mission Society. So it's a group of priests within the Archdiocese of Manila dedicated to China mission or mission among the Chinese. So it's a small group. They have 31 priests and 25 seminarians, right? 28 Chinese priests have been trained at LMI, even if they are not members of the mission society. So LMI uh, especially serves uh, Chinese pre seminarians coming from China to be trained here. But they're, once they're ordained, they may or may not join the mission society. All right, to give you a flavor, a sense of what the, somebody needs to be muted. Okay. So to give you a sense of what the National Apostolate, apostolate looks like, look at this church in Iligan, in Mindanao. 
it has Chinese elements in its architecture and in, in its liturgy. No? You have the tabernacle in a Chinese design, you have stained glass with Chinese characters. This is the resurrection of the Lord, Chinese Filipino parish in Iligan City. In Naga, you have the Our Lady of Fatima, Chinese Filipino community. They're not a parish, but a special center for the Chinese. No? So this is a Chinese New Year celebration. You have a veneration of the ancestors shown here. You know, they have this tablet dedicated to all the deceased members of the community. So later we'll see more of these uh, practices. No? This is the LMI community in January 2020. So if you go there, if you ever go there, you'll see this chapel with Chinese design also. So the place is uh, also uh, an example of the fusion of faith and culture. So this is a picture with Cardinal Tagle, with all their seminarians and formators. Okay, number four, the new immigrants. This is very interesting because it's very contemporary. We have observed since the 90s that there are new waves of migration. There are people from China coming to the Philippines and they are here to look for business opportunities. Now they're very different from the earlier waves. For example, my grandparents' generation, when they came in the 1930s, they were very poor. No, they were really trying to look for greener pastures. No, dirt poor, no money. But the ones coming now are not necessarily poor. They're not refugees. They're really coming here for business opportunities. So therefore maybe, it's harder to evangelize them, to reach out to them with some welfare activities, no? because uh, it's a different profile. So what the apostolate tried to do in the past is to offer free English classes for them, no? uh, just to help them localize, help them establish themselves in the country, uh, but that had limited success. Invite them to socials in the church, no? in a pastoral uh, setting, they would come to the church for baptisms, for weddings, but there were not, no real big breakthroughs. No, again, the, the phenomenon of being sacramentalized, because we're such a predominantly Catholic country, it's not very difficult to go to any church, attend the seminar, be baptized, the same for marriage. But is there really evangelization going on? That's a big question, no? So every time this happens, when you have a new immigrant being baptized, getting married in the church, I think it, it starts a cycle. No? It starts a, an, it's an entry point into the Catholic faith. So it was the same with my parents. For example, they got married in the church, but they were not practicing Catholics. We, my generation, became practicing Catholic because we went to Catholic schools. So the, the starting point may be simple baptism, simple wedding, but if the children are also brought up in the faith, sent to Catholic schools, then uh, the story develops. No, Then the, the faith takes root in a deeper way. And then you have this special group, the so-called Chinese students in Manila. I say students because majority of them, as you see in this picture, are seminarians or sisters studying theology or pastoral courses in Manila but you have a few lay students among them as well. They are organized into an association and about twice a year, they have a general assembly. So that's a special group. No? Uh, again, if you go back to the history, the idea that the Philippines is a base for mission in China. So in the early days, in the early centuries, they were thinking of, you know, send missionaries to China from the Philippines, whether those are Filipinos or foreigners. But now that's now that's also happening in a different way. The Chinese are the ones coming here, receiving their training, their education, their formation here. And then they are the ones going back to China, but trained in the Philippines. And then they are the ones evangelizing their own people. So that's a different model of mission, right? Because it's not that simple. It, in fact, it's not possible for foreigners to just go to China and start a missionary work. No, that, that's not technically possible. So it's the Chinese themselves who need to do it. And the big contribution of the Philippines is that many of these Chinese can come here very easily, especially now with the government so friendly to China and then get their training here, but then return to China. Now, this big topic of enculturation, I, I subtitled it fusion or confusion. 
So I mentioned sacramentalizing the Chinese. No, they become Catholic in name, but what are some of the issues they face? No? If you go to the Chinese rights controversy in China, then you will know the history of this. No? The missionaries were operating in China and they were facing these questions. Like for the Chinese with a very ancient culture, they were venerating their ancestors. It's, it, you know, the relationship with the dead is, is very important. It's a key concern. And the Chinese had their ways of honoring the dead. So the, the, the missionaries had to face that question. How do you incorporate that into their new Catholic faith? No, they had to answer this question because it was asked. No, if I'm Chinese, if I become Catholic, I become baptized, can I still honor my ancestors? And if yes or no, if yes, how, in what way, right? Because the Chinese uh, have all these values, these cultural symbols that, are, that were already there before Christianity. So you cannot just say, oh, you set all of that aside because now you're a Catholic, you're a Christian. I mean, some may approach it that way, but is that effective? Can you convert many people if that's your approach? That's the question, right? So uh, look at this private domestic altar. This is in somebody's house. No, this is a blow up on the right. So it's one altar, pero nagsama ang Our Lady of Fatima and Kuan Yin, the goddess of mercy, here in the center. And then you have an image of the Buddha. You have this here, another Chinese deity. This is the god of the earth, Tutikong. You have another Marian statue here. No? So this is what you might call syncretism. Parang halo-halo, pinagsasama-sama lahat. No? So is this good or bad? Is that... What kind of fusion is that? Is it fusion or is it confusion? That's the question, no? Because you have folk Chinese practices, and I dare I, I want to, to emphasize to you that it's not necessarily Buddhist. You hear a lot of Chinese, they might tell you, I'm Buddhist. But you know, I studied Buddhism. So I know that when they say I'm Buddhist, what they really mean is I follow folk Chinese practices, parang Chinese religions, rather than formal Buddhism, formal Taoism formal Confucianism. It's halo-halo, no? coming from their hometown, coming from their family. No? And then when they become Catholic, they don't let go of that. It can coexist with Catholic life, simultaneous with Catholic life. No? So therefore, what's happening there? Is it confusion? Right? Other examples of confusion, ito, kanina, we saw it in the altar, the God of the earth. Para itong mga ano, Diba, minsan pag dumadaan tayo, sinasabi natin, makikiraan po kasi we believe there are some spirits in the ground or in the trees. Well, that idea is also in the Chinese culture. Ito siya, Tutikong, the god of the earth, the territorial deity. So hindi siya iisang tao, hindi siya tao, no? hindi siya iisang persona. No? It's really every territory has a deity no? and you have to pay your respects, take care of them. So, paano yan? Do you do that still if you're Catholic? Or yung mga pamahiin sa patay, no? When, if you've ever been to a traditional Chinese wake, you will see this. There is a paper car, there is a paper house, paper airplane, paper money. Because of the folk belief that the Chinese, they still need these things in the other life. No, parang you're burning, susunugin lahat to eh, para sa patay. No, the idea is in the spirit world, they need the spirit equivalent of the car, the plane, the house. Meron pa yung tao sa loob if you look closely. You know, yung mga staff mo, mga household helpers mo. So again, if you're Catholic, can you still do all of this? Mga pamahiin ng mga Chinoy, no? Or ito, the, in Chinese religion, in Buddhism, you have Kuan Yin, the goddess of mercy, with so many titles, just like the Virgin Mary, madami siyang pangalan. Now you will hear Chinese people say, oh, they are the same. Si Mama Mary din yan. Ibang anyo lang. No? So those are possible sources of confusion. But of course, from the perspective of the church, what we are advocating is really the Chinese Filipino way of Catholicism. Of course, we want, rather than confusion, we want fusion in a good way. And this is what we might call enculturation as a, uh, an approach, a response to that cultural reality. Because the other two options, the first one I described as loose syncretism, halo-halo na lang, kahit ano pwede. Loose syncretism yun, ano? 
Pwede rin naman closed Catholic, nabanggit ko rin kanina, na sasabihin sa isang newly baptized, forget about your dragons, your Chinese New Year, your ancestors. Isang tabi mo na lahat yan because now you're Catholic. You follow the Roman Catholic way, right? Uh, so lahat Roman, kung ano yung tinuro sa simbahan, ano yung kulay, ano yung liturgy, ganyan. You just follow whatever the church prescribes. Not much room for culture to come in. So saradong katoliko, closed Catholic. Now, there's this third option, enculturation, which is aiming at that fusion. What is enculturation? Lest you think it is something new, a modern invention, no. It is the gospel taking root in another culture, which is happening from the very beginning of the church. Another way of understanding is, it is intertexts. You see one text, one object, no? it reminds you of another text. No? For example, the best example of that is Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico. To us, maybe it's just another image of Our Lady, another title, but for the Mexicans, for the Aztec peoples, every symbol in this image of Our Lady has a meaning. The fact na her, her uh, what do you call this? Her cloak is uh, with stars and she is standing on the moon. Uh, itong black sash niya, uh, itong bracelet niya, all of these have meanings for them. No, I won't get into it. You can look into the details. No? Pero when they saw these Uh, symbols, the coming together of night and day, you know, the coming together of the, the symbols for a virgin and a pregnant woman. You know? and ayan, They came to understand that the, who is the Virgin Mary and who is her son Jesus. So this uh, icon became the most effective way of evangelizing what is today Mexico. Yan ang intertexts. When you put two sets of symbols or texts and they come together, forming a new meaning. In a deeper way, enculturation is interweaving of our life stories with the story of Jesus. Diba? That's why we reflect on the gospel. Every Sunday, iba ang gospel. No? Pero may cycle naman yan. After one year, two years, three years, nadaanan mo na lahat ng gospel. Bakit pa ulit-ulit lang? Because our objective is, into, is to interweave our life stories with the story of Jesus. That's why we continuously reflect on the gospel. And that is also enculturation. Now, not something new. Saints Peter and Paul were already doing it in Greco-Roman culture. My favorite example there is the language that Jesus spoke. What was his language? Aramaic, not Greek. And yet, the New Testament was written in Greek not in the language of Jesus, right? So dun pa lang may enculturation na. They were translating the story of Jesus into Greek, into Greco-Roman culture. So lahat yung mga nakikita natin, mga chasuble ng pare, yung stola ng pare, lahat yan, you can trace it back to Greco-Roman culture. Later on, St. Thomas Aquinas, a great Dominican, what he did with Greek philosophy, canonizing Aristotle, yung kapangalan ko, no? uh, and Christianizing Greek philosophy. That's enculturation. Later on, Matteo Ricci, mentioned by Sir Leo kanina, no? the missionaries in China, trying to enculturate, trying to adapt to the Chinese setting. In India, you have people like Roberto de Nobili. No? Ganon. Adapting the, not just the dress, the outward manifestation of the holy people of those cultures, but Uh, facilitating that dialogue between Christianity and the local culture. So those are models from history. Now, in the local Chinese-Filipino context, how do you do that? Let me give you a lot of examples. Uh, baptism. This is a baptism, pero ginawa first birthday na of the baby. Kaya malaki na siya dito. Traditionally, Filipinos would have baptism quite soon after birth. Minsan, one month, two months. In the old, old days, within one day of birth. Kasi baka daw the baby will not survive. Ngayon, palate na ng palate. For the Chinese, they value the first birthday. It's special. It's celebration yan. Kasi the, the baby has survived. No? So yung iba, pinagsasabay na sa baptism. No? Isang party na lang. <laughs> so that's an example of enculturation. Sa engagement and wedding, no? you have this practice of the unity candle. And you have the 
the design of the unity candle has this character, double happiness. Uh, Kitang-kita yan sa mga traditional Chinese weddings. Double happiness meaning the two become one kasi the character is exactly the same on the right and left. So for weddings, you write it twice, you connect them, sanghi, shuang si, no? uh, that jives very well with the idea in the Christian understanding of marriage that the two become one flesh. Right? So you look for these meeting points between faith and culture. Again, so wedding pa rin, no? In traditional China, the wedding was done. Wala namang mass. It was just a traditional bowing ceremony. You bow three times, no? To your ancestors, to your parents, to each other. So meron yung adopted right for a Chinoy couple. If they want to do it, they can do this. Meron ding bowing ceremony to the first to God, facing the altar, and then to their parents, and then bowing to each other. No? So for, this is not required, it's optional, but it's available for those who wish to do it. That's coming from the temple. Why will you bring that into the church? Well, because it's just another way of lighting candles, of lighting incense. You can separate the, the, the Chinese religions from the forms of liturgy or liturgical worship. So this is a very simple but very common example of fusing faith and culture. You have the mass card, no? can have a Chinese design. In Chinese culture, no? uh, Catholics mark the 40th day. For Chinese, it's the 49th day. Again, because of some folk beliefs about what happens to the soul after death, kaya 49th day ang dinaraos, no? may padasal. So pwede namang pagsabayin yan. No? no problem there. In wake and funeral customs, like here, it's the funeral of a priest. And the other priests, the lay leaders, are using Chinese incense to honor the dead. This is another example of uh, incense being used to honor the alumni of a Chinese Catholic school. No? Every ano to, pag month of November, the month of the holy souls. Ito naman, uh, the same. So a generic way of praying for the dead on a Chinese altar. Simple lang. Flowers, fruits, candles, incense. This is Matteo Ricci. This is a lay Catholic who is being venerated in a Chinese parish no, to do the November All Souls ancestral altar inside a church. This is Mary the Queen, the one I mentioned earlier. So pag November, pag Chinese festival for the dead in April, pag lunar seventh month, these are the traditional times for praying for the dead. Then, John. So ano to? Para tong Bible verses, itong cabinets, ito yung parang toolbox. Every every drawer has a number corresponding to these sticks. Let's say 75 sticks. So pili ka ng, you shake the container you, and then you let one stick jump out and then whatever is the corresponding Bible verse, that's the message for you. Eh, di ba, sanay tayo yung parang fishbowl. You, you get one Bible verse. That's the message for you. This is just another way of doing it. But, saan nang gagaling to? Dito. If you go to a Chinese temple, now you pay attention. You will see a cabinet. Ganyan din. May verses yan in every drawer. And then on the celebrating the Chinese New Year, letting the lions into the venue to do their dance of worship. Worship for God, no? And this is Cardinal Tagle uh, presiding at a Chinese New Year Mass. This is my school, Saber School. It's a setup in our open area, open quadrangle for a Chinese New Year celebration. No? So, ayan. What else? Aside from the Chinese New Year, the other festival that's very important is the Moon Festival, or sometimes called the Mooncake Festival. But that's not a correct term because it's not naman about the mooncake. It's about the moon. No? This is sometime in September. So again, for the Hokkien Chinese, we have these dice games. Ito yung katuwaan for the festival. So again, that can be celebrated in a Catholic setting with mass and fellowship. No? And then, of course, our first Filipino saint, a Chinoy saint, uh, Lorenzo Ruiz, with his uh, Chinese name. No? So we honor him also. We honor also Mother Ignacia, another Chinese Filipino who founded the RBM Sisters, the Religious of the Virgin Mary. 
So finally, why is this topic important? You know, this subtopic in the life of the Philippine church? Well, because throughout history, the Philippines has been seen as a stepping stone to China. And in the examples I gave you, we saw that this is still true today. No, not so much in terms of being able to send missionaries there, although meron din, ha, mga lay missionaries who are quietly living there, working there, and through the example of their life, establishing a Christian presence there. And then you have all those Chinese who are coming here for education, for training. So in that way, we're still a stepping stone to China. And I, I, I would think uh, it's a very important model no? because it can happen not only in our country, but throughout the world where you have Chinese immigrants. And we know that they are all over the place. When I studied abroad, aside from meeting the OFWs, I also watched out for that. I noticed that in, like, in the, all the cities of Europe, you have a Chinese community. Yung merong may-ari ng Chinese takeaway, Chinese food. Yung merong Chinese bazaar selling general merchandise. No? So if you evangelize that group, then you also have a bridge to their networks in China. So that's one, stepping stone to China by working with the overseas Chinese or the local Chinese. And then it's also a model of evangelization in the Philippine Catholic Church. In, the, in our contemporary history, you see the value of schools and parishes that are dedicated to a particular cultural community in the Philippines. Now what I mentioned, this, the role of schools and parishes, how, how exactly the Chinese coming from China established themselves in the Philippines. There was intermarriage. What happens to the next generations? One particular thing in the area of religious studies is this expansion of Chinese syncretism to include Catholicism. I'm not saying that's correct. No, I'm just saying that happens because of the Chinese mindset of always including, expanding. Uh, then you have syncretism. But as I said, if you ask from the perspective of the church, the goal is enculturation, not loose syncretism. So I end with just a few images of uh, possibilities no? when you allow uh, Chinese Filipino Catholics to interact with uh, the church abroad, or when you try to uh, develop or be bold in facilitating that meeting of faith and culture. So because majority of the Chinese in the Philippines come from Fujian and uh, Xiamen is a major port, then you know they are building now their new cathedral and they try to raise money here among Chinese Filipino Catholics. So merong ganong relationship. For pilgrimages, no? <clears throat> people don't understand that the church is functioning. Of course, maraming restrictions, but... But uh, in Taiwan, which is a free society, you have this big Marian shrine very near Taipei, Wu Fengqi, and it's designed like the Temple of Heaven in Beijing. Uh, in my school, when before the pandemic, when we bring them to, for study tours to China, we always go to church. This is in Shanghai. This is in Beijing. Well, because people don't understand that, yeah, China is a communist country, but officially, if you look at the worldwide experience, Assimilation is really a normal process. If you look at the older uh, immigrants, no, let's say yung mga merong uh, surnames like Kohuanko, Teotico, Tuaso, yung mga naging Filipino na talaga. Uh, is that what will happen to everybody eventually? No, and then wala, wala na masyado ito. No, so it's a complex reality because then again you also have the new immigrants coming in. So preserving heritage is hard work. It requires conscious effort, it requires resources, or else it is easily lost. So for our first question po, Father, from Ms. Arjun A. Clasara, my question is, were there attempts to synthesize Catholic theology, how doctrine is to be expressed or articulated? For example, articulating Catholic doctrine with a Confucian lens. <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> thank you for that question. I began to answer it already in the chat box. Um, it, it's a very good question no? because uh, I, I spoke more of in liturgical enculturation, what you uh, experience in day-to-day -day life, no? uh, marking milestones in life, in your daily uh, worship, your prayer, your Sunday mass, mga ganyan, festivals. But yes, 
there is also theological enculturation. So I give some examples here. For example, filial piety, so important in Chinese culture. What does it mean? Is it blind obedience to your parents? It's a very strong value. But you can reflect on that in terms of the, fa uh, the father and the son, uh, the relationship with the Trinity, everything that Jesus said about him and the father being one. And then you have the Ten Commandments and honor your father and your mother. So there is a very broad area there for reflection, for looking at, at uh, the Ten Commandments, looking at Jesus and the father from a, a Confucian lens. No? Uh, and then I give the other example of uh, uh, translation being a very fertile ground for uh, theological reflection. How do you, I mean, Matteo Ricci and his companions in China, that was their big question. How do you translate God? How do you say God? No? And they, they worked with a few, few options before finally deciding on what we use today, Tian Chu, Tian Chu. No? Uh, I give the example from the fourth gospel in John. No? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, word. So in the beginning was the word. How do you translate word into Chinese? So uh, some Bible translations use the word Tao. No? Uh, Tao means as in Taoism, which means the way, literally the way. So just by that act of translation, in the same way that the story of Jesus was translated into Greek, by that act of translation, there is theological reflection going on. What is the way? What is, Jesus, what is the word? What is being as something that was there from the beginning, not just with the birth of Jesus? So yes, th these are just two examples of uh, many, many possibilities for theological reflection. Thank you, Father. So for our next question Paul, from Mr. Glendale John Go, um, aside from Catholicism, is there a survey to but that some Chinese engage in non-Catholic Christianity? What was the predominant Christian denomination they engaged in? Um, there's no particular survey that looks at this, no? The, the reality came about because in like the surveys done by Teresita Angsi in 1995, and then more recently she repeated it, no, you will ask for religious affiliation, no? So the usual, you know, when you're filling up a form, what is your religion? You put Roman Catholic, Protestant. Now, those, some of them would say, I'm a Buddhist Catholic, or I'm a Catholic Buddhist, no? So then th that, that, that led to more questions. Now, what do people mean when they say that? No? So actually, they mean, if, with the interviews, you we found out that what they mean is that they're practicing Catholicism. At the same time, they're also doing some temple life, participating in some level of temple life. So there was no, there's no particular survey looking at that. But in terms of the Christian de denomination, where this is a reality, it's more uh, prevalent among Catholics because among Protestant Christians, I think they have a clearer maybe teaching uh, that discourages that kind of syncretism. Now, I don't want to judge that whether that's good or bad, uh, pero maybe it happens less with the Protestant Christians because um, maybe, maybe they've made a judgment about how to regard, how to to deal with cultural symbols, with translation, etc. Thank you, Father. So moving on to our third question. From um, Mr. Emmanuel Jerick Alvera. So his question was, what Asian Chinese tradition usually go well with Catholic practices? Well, you know, in my research, uh, many of the Buddhists say that they like the Catholics because it's so much easier to enter into dialogue. And there are a lot of parallels. I don't say they're the same. You know, it's very, very maybe too loose or too, too uh, flippant to say that they're just the same. But there are many parallels. For example, the devotion to Mary, parallel to the devotion to Kuan Yin, the goddess of mercy. Now, in a popular level, people will say, oh, they're the same, they're the same. But, you know, uh, if you study their history the, the, and everything that goes with them, they're not exactly the same, but they have similar characteristics. Um, Catholics, we have devotion to the saints and you have patron saints for various purposes, right? Patron saint for, for unwed mothers, those who want to have children, patron saint for studies, patron saint for cancer, patron saint for this and that. In Buddhism, they have bodhisattvas. In Mahayana Buddhism, Bodhisattvas are those who delay their Buddhahood, their enlightenment, so that they can help those 
who are in particular need. So for example, there is the Bodhisattva Garba in charge of the underworld. So you pray to that Bodhisattva to pray for the dead, right? There is a Bodhisattva for wisdom. There's a Bodhisattva for, for having children, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there are many of these parallel practices, beads. We have our rosary beads. The Buddhists also have their, their beads, no? reciting the name of the Buddha in the same way that we have the Jesus prayer, no? the devotion to the name of Jesus. So there are many parallels like that that lead people to say, oh, Buddhism and Catholicism are so compatible. Of course, if you're a scholar, if you study it, you can't just say they're similar because there are also major, major differences in the nature of the soul. No? For Buddhism, there's no soul. No? They have rebirth. Uh, cycles of rebirth until you become enlightened when you're a human person. But for Christianity, there's only one unique soul that wants to be united with God forever. So that's a major difference that cannot be glossed over. But the short answer is uh, Buddhism is usually pointed to as uh, being very compatible with Catholicism. Thank you, po, Father. So another question po from Mr. Eman Velasquez. During the Spanish period, divide and conquer was utilized by the Spaniards to feed Filipinos towards, towards each other. The same goes with the Sangli. In the case of the clergy, did the Phil Chinese missionaries and latest face discrimination? Um, <clears throat> the clergy did not face discrimination because they were the ones reaching out. No, But the Chinese certainly faced a lot of discrimination. No, there were, uh, in the Qing dynasty, which would correspond to the Spanish uh, period here, you had the Chinese men who were in the Philippines who were wearing that long queue, yung nakatilintas na buhok, no? which symbolized their, their being part of the Qing dynasty. So one big question they faced was, you know, if you become a Catholic, uh, should you cut off that, it's called the queue, no? should you cut that off uh, as a sign that you are renouncing uh, your 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 allegiance to this dynasty, but then the Chinese would say, "Oh, but you know what? If I go back to China, if I don't have that, then it causes problems for me." Um, that's just one example, and and, and you know, even in twentieth century, there's there's a lot of uh, uh, bullying or or discrimination against the Chinese, in, in, not just in the Philippines, but in various parts of the world. Thank you, Father Ari. So another question, po, from John Bryan Tabaho. Um, the Chinese communities in the Philippines were ostracized during the Spanish colonial period. Even well into the American period, did the church make any attempts to uphold the, the rights of the Chinese, particularly the Chinese converts in the Philippines? Um, yes, the, the missionaries who were assigned to these parishes would be the ones with the background, with the, with the resources to stand up for the Chinese, no? to, to sort of uh, speak up for their rights, no. Um, but that would happen in a Catholic setting uh, through their their institutions. But but uh, they were limited in their influence to those who belonged to to their communities because not all not all were baptized, right? Thank you, Father. So next, naman po from Dr. Tristan Osteria from the USC Department of History. So the question is, how has the culture of the Chinese and the Chinese Filipinos changed over the centuries? You talk about rituals, traditions, and practices. But with the introduction of Catholicism and end of Latinization, even Americanization, were the rituals, traditions, and practices that has been altered or, or done away with, what are its implications for, for younger generations seeking to find their roots or chart a way to the future? Right. Again, that's also a very uh, important question, a crucial question, no? Because culture is something that's alive. It's not static. Even all those practices that I, I mentioned uh, very quickly, um, they don't remain the same over time. It's constantly evolving. So, for example, the traditional Chinese engagement ceremony or wedding ceremony, when I observe it today, and then I observe it from the time of my parents, what they did, it gets it, it keeps getting simplified. Pasimple ng pasimple because you know, trabaho yan, magasto, so people want to simplify, simplify, simplify. So of course, over time, something is lost. No, 
um, which is good, can be good or bad. Um, at, it's lost, but at least it's still preserved. You know? So I'll give you an example. When we have visitors from mainland China, let's say from Fujian, our ancestral province, and then they see some of the things we're doing, and then they will say, oh, we don't do that in China. So you will be surprised now. Oh, what are we doing here? If they're not doing it in China, are we being authentic here? But then you think about it a bit and you realize, well, there's now been how many decades, 70 years of, of communism in China. And one of the big drives of communism is to root out superstition, to put religion under, to, under control. No? So, so they lost it much earlier because of communism. No? The, many of the rituals that uh, our ancestors brought to the Philippines are now either lost or very weak in China. No? But we are the ones preserving it here, right? But the way we have preserved it is also much simpler than that, what it was during the time of our ancestors or grandparents and great grandparents. So it's something alive. Now, what is the implication of that for younger generations? Well, precisely the role of institutions, of community leaders, is to reflect, to discern what should be preserved and in what way and in what form. So the parishes, the schools are trying to do that. Uh, is there a black and white answer? No, but you, tr you have to keep trying, no? Because even if we're becoming a global world, we are a global world. I always like to tell young people, alam mo, yung globalization na yan, you think globalization means westernization, which is not the case. You know, you're not more global because you're more Amer American, right? It's not the case. Everybody participates in the global village, in globalization from their own vantage point. You have to know your own language, your own culture. That is what you are bringing to the table in the global village. No? You don't participate there by becoming more like them because you want to speak English all the time and follow American or European culture. You feel you're being more global. I don't think so. No? Wala ka namang, kung yun lang, ulit, ulitin mo lang everything you're hearing from them, what are you really contributing? You should contribute from your own vantage point as a Filipino or as a Chinese Filipino or whatever your, your specific way of being Filipino is. So, so yes, the culture is always in danger of being lost. So, so it needs a proactive stance. Because if you don't pay attention to these questions, Eddie, we will all just become more westernized or whatever the dominant culture is right now, K-pop, K-drama. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, we will all become more Korean because it's it's uso, diba? Uh, so yung ganon. I think it's culture is just so dynamic, and uh, community leaders have a very big role to play. Uh, Father, may follow up question po. Um, are there connect connections and networks between the Chinese Filipinos and the overseas Chinese? Catholicism appears to define the identity of the Chinese Filipinos. Meron din. Um, at various levels, so if we are Chinese Filipino Catholics, so if we meet Chinese Catholics from China, from Taiwan, from Malaysia, so there's a bond there, parang double, but not only are we ethnically Chinese, you know, using those terms I shared earlier, we share a common ethnic identity, if we also share the same Catholic faith, then there's a deeper level of networking, so th that's one network. Another network is among all the overseas Chinese, oh yes, there are very strong networks, maybe stronger than the Chinese Catholic networks, because the overseas Chinese like to organize themselves according to their hometowns or their surnames. So this is another big area of Chinese studies. No? So wherever you are, if you belong to the, let's say, the Tan Association, no? there would be a Tan Association regionally and worldwide. The Li Association, ang laki niyan, grabe. They have regional convention, world convention, of all the people with the same surname. So yes, those networks are very, very strong. Thank you, Father Ari. Uh, so next question naman po is from Edward Chico. Um, he's a teacher po from Lourdes School, Quezon City, and a Tomasian alumno. So the question is, what are the limits of enculturation, especially in the mass? Some traditionalist Catholics, for instance, have this idea that nothing can be changed when it comes to the sacred rites themselves and that the liturgy is not the place to introduce one's culture. How then can enculturation be reconciled with our Roman traditions? 
And in the process of inculturation, is it necessary to preserve the Roman character of our faith? Wow, thank you for that. That's a very, in a way, a controversial question, no? Because you hit the nail on the head, no? Uh, when we say Roman Catholicism, yung pagka-Roman niya, yung ba ay nakataga sa bato, na everything has to be done in the Roman way, no? So there are many, many uh, related questions to that. So uh, let's start with liturgy, no? So if your mindset is that the Roman Catholic way, meaning even the forms, not just the, not the substance, but the forms are, are so important that they can never be changed, then inculturation, uh, going back to the original meaning, the original spirit of inculturation can never take place because you are so attached already to the Roman Catholic way of doing it. You know, for example, uh, colors, liturgical colors. We all know that colors are cultural, culturally dictated. What is, what is happy for us may not be a happy color for other people. For example, yellow. Pag mang yellow, di ba happy naman ang yellow, hindi yung dilawan na, yung yellow lang. Bright, happy color, right? But if you go to Japan, pag yellow, chrysanthemum yata yan, eh, color for the dead yan. No? Yung mga ganun ba, or chrysanthemum throne. I, I, you know, it's just a top of my mind example, but colors uh, have different meanings in different cultures. So how can we insist that green is for ordinary time, violet is for penance, for ganyan, uh, gold, white is for uh, pastors, for major feasts. So, for example, liturgical inculturation. Kapag Chinese New Year, we use red in the mass, like what I showed you in the picture. Oh, if you are strictly Roman Catholic, hindi pwede yan. Kasi red is for martyrdom, for the Holy Spirit only. So, paano pumasok sa Chinese New Year yan? Because red is the happy color for Chinese. So, by doing that, you are you know, by using red, we are taking a stand that you can inculturate within the mass. Now, it's very complex because there are no hard and fast rules. Lalo na in the Philippines where we are a minority, there are no pronouncements from the bishops about what is allowed, what is not allowed. If you go to the church in Taiwan, dun meron. In fact, many of our practices of inculturation are patterned after what the Chinese Catholics are doing in Taiwan because they have been through the process, no? So, uh, example yun, the colors. Yung isang big issue, yung mga lion dance na yan, dragon dance. Yung dragon pa lang eh, di ba? In the Bible, the dragon is a negative metaphor. The devil, no? Slaying the dragon. St. George slaying the dragon. E sa Chinese culture, positive ang dragon eh. It symbolizes the emperor. Uh, everything grand and majestic in the heavens, no? It's a positive symbol. So, it takes a process of education to, to educate uh, Chinese Catholics na, yeah, in the Bible, uh, there are also cultural symbols that you cannot take literally, cannot be taken always at face value. So you need this mindset to, to be able to be more critical in our appreciation of the Bible, of scripture and tradition. I don't know if I'm sounding radical, but to me, it's not radical. It's really the gospel. No, uh, We have to be able to differentiate form from substance. The substance we have to preserve, but the form can change. So that's a very helpful distinction from philosophy, from scholastic philosophy. Form and substance. Yung substance hindi nagbabago yan, pero the form can change. Now, in what way? Then that takes the community to reflect together. Ano ba ang pwedeng mangyari? Ano hindi dapat mangyari? For example, yung mga alay. No, when we make a life for the dead, pray for the dead in a Catholic setting, it's very simple. It's not like the ally you find in the temples or in the in the house when you're preparing a life for, for your dead relatives. Pag sa simbahan ginawa yan, very simple, fruits lang. No, walang whole chicken, whole fish na ang daming handa. No? So these are just some uh, examples. So it's not black and white. It takes the community to reflect. It takes the priest who is in charge of a parish, for example, to be bold enough to try things, no? And then see if it's meaningful to the community and then to, to, to do that, yeah. So form and substance, very important distinction. Thank you, Father. So question naman po from Moira Iradel. 
Um, may I ask what are the differences and similarities of Chinese Catholicism and Chinese Buddhism rituals and practices? Yeah, I, I began, mentioned that already earlier. No, yung, yung, uh, I mentioned the prayer forms like the beads, the litanies, the titles of Our Lady, the comparison of the patron saints with the bodhisattvas, and then the, I can add the tradition of meditation. Ito baliktad naman. This is very strong in Buddhism. The way to enlightenment is right mind, right concentration, part of the Noble Eightfold Path. So you don't become enlightened by following rituals, by even the beads, praying all these uh, repetitive prayers. The final, in the final analysis, you can only be enlightened with a lot of meditation. And it's a discipline. Sitting down, paying attention to your posture. Mga Zen, Zen Buddhism or Chan Buddhism, no? Um, that's how you liberate your mind because that's the objective, to liberate your mind from all attachments. No? Um, the very strong in Buddhism, present in Christianity, in Catholicism, pero hindi mainstream. No, we have the contemplatives, the monks, the nuns who are spending all their time in silence, in meditation. Pero sila yun, parang they're always apart from us. No? One of my dreams is if that can become stronger in Catholic life, that we also spend time meditating together quietly. No? Uh, Maybe the adoration of the Blessed Sacrament is an entry point for that. No? That we, we don't have to have a speaker all the time. Mahil tayo eh. Speaker, speaker, speaker. Talk, talk, talk. Laging, we're not comfortable enough with silence. But in Buddhism, that's very strong. And it's present in, in Christianity, in Catholicism, but needs more mainstreaming. Thank you, po, Father. In relation to that, po, our last question is from Charlie Carlos. So are there notable comparisons between the enculturated faith of the Chinoy to that of the local enculturated faith of Filipino? Yes, I think there's also a move to inculture, for enculturation in Filipino Catholicism. For example, you have the Misa ng Sambayanan in liturgy, no? where, where there's a, a rearrangement of the parts of the Mass. Uh, you have local languages. Uh, but I would, I would say that these are not mainstream, again, also not mainstream enough. Um, there are efforts, like, for example, pag fiesta, no? if you, I've said mass in, let's say, in the north, visiting uh, communities there. How do they make their offerings? Hindi pera. Hindi yung collection basket where you drop money. During offertory, they really bring their harvest, sacks of rice, vegetables. That talagang yun ang alay nila. They bring it in front of the altar. So that's also enculturation, that people are making their offering from their context as farmers. No? So things like that. Um, other things in liturgy, um, not too many examples of that. No? But, uh, but, but music, certainly, there's a lot of liturgical music that is, is also enculturation, a uh, translation, that's a, a big effort of enculturation. Pero in terms of symbols, rituals, maybe more limited. Thank you, po, Father. So, thank you very much for your questions, our dear audiences, as well as your enlightening response, po, Father Ari.